Okay, what I'm going to talk about this morning is something I've been working on uh, both as a researcher and, as Monsi said, as a little bit as a, uh, as a voice uh, in terms of um, public concerns about the, the swine industry. Uh, and so I'm going to uh, pose this question, you know, of this livestock-associated MRSA. Many of you, I'm sure, are aware of it. Those who aren't, I'll give us uh, a talk through that. Um, I'm calling it tiger or pussycat. It's a, a apparently emerging disease. Uh, a lot of concerns about what it means for public health, but really uh, trying to understand uh, what sort of threats it really does pose. Um, Actually, this quote I used to be on the door of my PhD advisor in Australia, and it's something I remember the, the day I read it, saying the larger the island of knowledge, the longer a shoreline of doubt. And I was pretty young there and thought, you know, once I keep reading the book and I'm done, it's all over. I'll know everything. When we're in reality, we discover. And, and I think this, uh, this issue is a very good uh, illustration of, of how we, things look simple at the beginning, but in biology, they always get more complex. The more we learn, all of a sudden, well, what about that, what about that? And that's uh, it's job security for the research crowd, but it really is, a, I think, uh, something that's true. OK, outline of my talk, what are these things we're calling livestock-associated MRSA? What has been their impact on public health? Um, then I'm going to talk about, really, the plot thickens, how it actually gets a little bit more confusing. Um, then there's, there's an issue of, well, where did these things come from, uh, why they're there, and that, that I'll focus on research that we've done over the last couple of years here at the University of Minnesota. Uh, and to finish up, I'm going to talk about what are livestock-associated MRSA, because I think where we end up thinking what they are wasn't where we started out. Um, just to get everyone on the same page, uh, Staph aureus, I remember when I was a veterinary student, it was the first organism I ever saw in a, in a Petri dish in our microbiology class. Uh, it's a very, very uh, familiar pathogen to most people. Um, people in the room, uh, normally uh, warm-blooded animals, it's, uh, it's normal flora in a lot of species, or at least we think it is, and we always have in the pig and in the human, but when we say normal flora, typically only about 30% of people are colonised, so you can sort of argue, aren't the other 70% that aren't colonised more normal? Uh, but what the point is, it's a very, very common organism colonising people. Uh, it's also a really important uh, so-called opportunistic pathogen. So most people carry it round never get sick, never have a problem, uh, but it can cause severe disease and it causes an incredibly broad spectrum of disease conditions compared to most uh, pathogens. They go from being an insignificant little pimple to fatal uh, septicemia uh, uh, infections. Um, skin and soft tissue infections are very important uh, and it also causes this invasive disease which we may see as pneumonia, uh, septicemia uh, and death and, and those categories are, are, I'll come back to as we try and understand what these organisms are doing. Um, really important thing to re re that never gets mentioned is uh, prior to the antibiotic era, if you had Staph aureus uh, septicemia, and that means old-fashioned Staph aureus, not, not MRSA, uh, the fatality rate was 80%. It dropped to 20% once penicillin was introduced. So in terms of the, uh, uh, the antibiotic era and what antibiotics have done, they've turned this from being more or less a death sentence to be something where the survival statistics are actually pretty good. And even today, the survival statistics for MRSA bacteremia are around 20%, even though we have a lot of angst to them. So uh, we're battling in the antibiotic era, but, uh, but at the moment we're, we're still holding our own. Uh, the MRSA um, things which you'll um, see in the press on a fairly frequent basis uh, appeared in 1961 because methicillin was introduced to medical care about 1959-60 in different places. So a uh, common story, like with penicillin, as soon as the drug is used broadly, uh, resistant organisms get detected. Uh, over the next 20, 30 years, uh, the methicillin-resistant variants that I'll, I'll call MRSA from now on uh, emerged to be a major problem of chronically ill people, particularly in, uh, in hospitals, healthcare, aged care, uh, aged care uh, facilities, um, and that was globally. Uh, and the resistance was linked to antimicrobial use in hospitals. Uh, it was termed, uh, uh, called or christened hospital association or acquired uh, MRSA. Uh, and the truth back in 1995, we could say, is that MRSA was a problem of the hospitals. It ha wasn't a concern for healthy citizens in the general community. Uh, and nobody even talked about animals having any role in the epidemiology of, of Staph aureus infections in humans. Um, 
One of the, the, the truths I like to say is in biology, the truth's a moving target. Uh, things change over time and we're always chasing trying to understand what the reality is rather than discover a fixed reality. Uh, and what happened in the mid-1990s, globally, all of a sudden, people who weren't in healthcare institutions started getting MRSA infections. And these were christened community-associated or community-acquired MRSA infections. It was a different epidemiology. Most of these were skin and soft tissue infections, so not the fatal septicemias and things, uh, but still very prevalent. And you'll read news about them this week about sports teams in different parts of the country and outbreaks in uh, uh, college and even professional football teams have, been, uh, ha have had outbreaks. Uh, uh, key thing here is that the, the variants, the types of Staph aureus that were in the community associated ones were distinct. They were new clones, they weren't the same ones that had been there in the hospital. So most people looking at this said this was like a quantum shift in the epidemiology of a major human pathogen. What happened then, 2004, we had the first detection, or was it emergence, of what are called livestock-associated MRSA, and again, initially, a new bug, a novel lineage of MRSA that hadn't been previously seen in the hospital or community-associated uh, arenas, and therefore the discussion was we've had another quantum change in, uh, uh, in Staph aureus epidemiology, uh, and that's when uh, uh, a lot of the focus turned to the pig industry. Uh, a little bit of context here, internationally, uh, Staph aureus infections help happen globally. The proportion that are methicillin-resistant strains is highly variable uh, among countries, uh, and as you can see just by the colour schemes of the map there, uh, the US on that map is in the 25 to 50 per cent, was actually 48 per cent at the time that study was published, uh, meaning that about half the, uh, the, the Staph aureus infections happening in people in the US are methicillin-resistant, very prevalent. That is different in other countries, and the country that we'll talk about now is Holland, uh, and if you can see the arrow pointing at it, and you can see that Holland, uh, Norway, and Sweden are the three countries that have the lowest proportion of Staph aureus in their clinical isolates at less than 1%. So that's really um, where our study starts, because in, uh, uh, sorry, our study, our story starts, uh, because the Dutch have this very low MRSA prevalence, and they put a lot of resources into maintaining that. They have a very intensive screening and typing uh, uh, policy and what they call a search and destroy policy, uh, whereas if you're going in for major surgery in a Dutch hospital, you'll be tested for, for MRSA and if you're positive, you'll be put into isolation and you'll undergo a decontamination or decolonization uh, protocol using drugs specifically for that purpose. Uh, most parts of the world don't do that uh, and obviously if 50% of your cases are positive, it was logistically very hard. But they could do it with this very low prevalence that they had and they would argue they have the low prevalence because they have this. So the story really starts with a six-month-old girl who had a congenital heart defect and she was going in to have a, a open heart surgery, so she got screened for MRSA and she came up positive. Um, what was interesting about it was they do this typing with this SMAR1 pulse field gel electrophoresis. So it's a, a genetic fingerprinting method that they use on all their MRSA license. Also the same as used by the CDC, uh, Minnesota Department of Health. It's a standard method across the world for, for, the, for the detective work in tracing MRSA infections. Um, and that isolate was weird because the enzyme wouldn't cut the DNA into slices. They couldn't read it. So it was termed a, a non-typable isolate. Someone looked at their, their data and they found two other non-typable isolates that were, couldn't be cut with this uh, restriction enzyme and they said, well, that's strange and sat, looked further and all three cases were linked epidemiologically to pigs and the girl that you see there is the index case uh, with her parents 10 years later, happy and healthy. She never actually had an infection. She was colonised uh, and came up as positive. Um, so if we go forward, what that did in Holland, if you're thinking you've only got a very low MRSA prevalence in the whole country, you're doing the screening uh, procedures and you find out that you've got uh, a reservoir that could be in the, in the pig world, you start going and look at that reservoir and that is what happened. Before I go a little further, I'll just give a, a little brief session here on uh, subtyping methods. You, you, you're pretty much used to what can be done at a molecular level with sequencing of PERS, sequencing of other uh, pathogens. Uh, there's uh, several methods that are used for uh, Staph aureus. The first is pulse field gel electrophoresis, which I mentioned. What I'm on the right-hand side, you can see what's the characteristic of what was called these original livestock-associated variants. It couldn't be typed. 
MLST is a sequence-based method where you look at seven different genes, and it's sort of like identifying them at a family level. It puts them into groups that are closely related because there's enzyme patterns, sequences for the seven, um, for the seven um, genes are identical. So we give them a number. So this uh, livestock one's at sequence type 398. Uh, sometimes you'll see CC, uh, clonal complex, but we use the sequence typing as one method. Uh, there's another method that's uh, SCC MEC typing, which is, again, sequence the gene uh, or the, the part of the DNA where the resistance gene is. I won't talk further about that. Uh, and there's a method called SPAR typing, which is typing of a short section of one very small gene that is unique to Staph aureus, uh, and that is uh, used with two different systems to categorise them by that. So as I talk, go forward, I'll be talking about sequence types. So if you see ST398, that's sort of like the umbrella group. And I'll be talking about SPAR types, usually with these little uh, designations of TO34, which are the rhythm system in Europe for categorizing SPAR types. So uh, I hope that you can follow the story because that, that it's sort of important to understanding it. I'm uh, not famous for biblical quotes in my talks, but this is the one I do use. Uh, Matthew 7.7, 7, seek and ye shall find. Matthew wasn't a uh, microbiologist, but he was a tax collector. So I say for either a tax collector or a microbiologist, it's a pretty good motto to have. And when they looked uh, in Holland, they see, sought in the Hogs uh, Reservoir 39% of a national study their pigs were positive for MRSA, which is a frightening discovery, as you could imagine. All of these isolates belong to a single clonal group which had the characteristics I talked about. They were not typable by PFGE, like the case in the girl and the others. Uh, they were MLST ST398, which I'll we'll talk about again a little bit later, and there were three uh, related SPAR types. Uh, they were uniformly resistant to tetracycline, which is uncommon in human MRSA isolates, so immediately that spawned the idea it must be tetracycline use in the pig industry that selected these organisms uh, and uh, in many cases, it must be growth-promoting use of tetracyclines that spawn this selection. And we'll come back to that to a little bit if time gives us. So they also looked in uh, farm workers, and guess what? 23% of the pig farmers they looked at, small sample initiative, were carrying um, livestock-associated MRSA, or the ST398 MRSA, and that was approximately 800 times higher than the average Dutch population. So it's a huge public health concern and focus, uh, and the Dutch health authorities actually changed their whole screening policy, so if people came to hospital or into healthcare situations who were pig farmers, veterinarians, uh, cattle farmers, anyone who had contact with livestock, they would go through the isolation and uh, decontamination screen uh, um, if appropriate. Uh, the other thing, seek and you shall find, if you look enough, uh, looked in pork and ST398 MRSA were detected in pork and obviously that opens a whole new area of public discussion of, of the threat that this organism poses. Um, in 2008, uh, there was a review from the Dutch scientists who were involved in this, and it's a good review, but their, their take-home points were these. Hey, look, this isn't just a Dutch problem, it's bigger than this, uh, that it could become an important um, source of community-associated MRSA. Uh, the epidemiology was different to what they saw with the classic uh, hospital and community strains. They uh, believed that interhuman spread is possible, and it is uh, possible, and the conclusion was probably just a matter of time until there is an outbreak. Okay, most of you are aware of how our media reacts to our industry. So all of a sudden we had blood in the water and we had sharks. Uh, and uh, uh, Monty mentioned Nicholas Krestoff, who contributed a, uh, several years ago an article about an outbreak in, uh, in Indiana, which uh, didn't actually exist. Um, Marin McKenna is a journalist, uh, reported on pig MRSA, uh, involved in the death of the child, even though it wasn't actually MRSA, it was MSSA, and there was no pig involvement. That didn't stop us. Uh, recently, Mark Bitten, Bittman in the New York Times, and there's no shortage of this, uh, this literature uh, that adds to the argument in two ways. It provides some myths provide some misinformation uh, and not much uh, enlightenment. And I, most of the proceedings paper I wrote about the politics of, uh, of, of MRSA in, in the public arena. Uh, today I'm not going to talk more about it um, other than, uh, and I'm going to talk more about the science part. Um, Dave um, Pyburn, I've lost it now, uh, showed me the uh, copy of today's USA Today in the life section 
and the headline reads, Exposure to Pig Manure Raises Risk of MRSA Infection. So that's today's paper uh, based on a study out of Johns Hopkins. Uh, Liz Wagstrom's um, uh, quoted in that in a response. Uh, uh, and again, these things are happening on a very frequent basis. Uh, probably Liz knows more than I do about, you know, it's a full-time job in trying to manage the misinformation around MRSA and the livestock uh, uh, session, and we'll probably be chatting about that later on. Um, okay. MRSA in animals, uh, this is a timeline of the publications and you know, the red line on the uh, left hand side there is show uh, the time was in decades or five years. No one cared. There was a few early isolations, no publications at all around the turn of the, the new millennium and then in, uh, we had uh, isolations of what's going in Holland with pig. We also had isolations from sheep. Um, I won't go any further, but in 2010 I stopped counting when there were 50 publications and I haven't had the time to count since. It's just a real explosion in research related to MRSA in the livestock sector and, and a large proportion of that's been in the pig industry. Um, so if there's something that are generally accepted facts, one is these ST398 MRSA occur in several species of livestock and occur in multiple countries. Uh, one thing that's certainly very well established is that people who work in those industries, farmers, veterinarians, slaughter pack workers, people who have contact with live animals have an elevated risk of nasal carriage of livestock MRSA. And so the, uh, across studies you will see 20 to 50 percent in farmers is quite common. Uh, most of it's out of Europe and most of what they find are these uh, uh, so-called uh, livestock associated MRSA. But there's a lot of questions around it, uh, and particularly that given that you know, there's not many reports of these people actually getting ill. So are they truly colonised? Are these MRSA setting up shop, or are you just in the barn and, and we're swabbing uh, barn dust out of the nostrils of the people working with the animals? So that remains a, a question of interest, and really what's the consequent risk to health? Um, some studies, and the Dutch have done really good work on this because they spend a lot of money on it, uh, there's a couple of studies showing that in generally for most people, ST398 is a poor colonizer and that's been done looking at research workers and veal farmers and once they have time away from animals the colonization rate drops. Um, work done in hospitals have shown that uh, the ST398 variants are four to six times less transmissible than the, the standard human variants of, uh, of, of MRSA uh, and it was these people concluded it's actually insufficient to lead to a, an epidemic in a hospital situation. So far there is yet to be a genuine uh, uh, outbreak in a hospital or in a community or anywhere. So something that doesn't seems to get forgotten in a lot of the news, news reports. Um, I was um, approached by the National Pork Board to sort of review this issue and try and understand what the burden of disease from ST398 was uh, globally. I did this, uh, submitted it uh, finally, finished it last year. And at that stage there was 89 papers that reported ST398 associated clinical disease. Uh, so we went through that and looked at how many isolates, how many cases they had, what were the clinical presentations, how many were invasive, and invasive was very conservative saying if it was anything that wasn't clearly a skin and soft tissue infection, we call it invasive, uh, were there fatalities and were there history of animal contact. I'll share some of that results with you. So across those we had two and a half thousand cases, 2,000 or more were screening isolates. So that means they're from healthy, well not necessarily healthy people, but people who didn't have infections. They were being screened on the way into healthcare institutions. They didn't have an infection. About 500 were clinical. Uh, 200 of those, there was no information. They said they had clinical infections, but we didn't know whether they were severe or what they were. Uh, uh, and there were 125 invasive cases, five fatal cases, and this pie chart gives you an idea of what they looked like. Uh, more than half of them were skin or soft tissue infections, which normally aren't uh, life-threatening, but a considerable number of bacteremic pneumonic cases. That pie chart looks what's like what Staph aureus does. So these organisms are capable of producing pretty much the same spectrum of clinical diseases that, uh, that other Staph aureus do. Um, interesting thing, when we looked at the invasive disease, uh, uh, the majority of these invasive cases weren't actually MRSA. They were MSSA, meaning not methicillin susceptible um, um, Staph aureus. And the other thing that was uh, uh, striking in the invasive cases is that a lot of them had no documented 
livestock exposure. So most of the time you couldn't work that out, uh, but those where it was stated uh, there was 26 per cent of people ha who said, no, I have no livestock contact, content, uh, contact sorry, and of those that did, 10 per cent. So a very big, uh, a sort of unexpected, you know, a paradox really of why are we seeing more cases in, the, in, uh, in those, certainly there's more of those people. Another study that was done was looking in across uh, U.S. laboratories, and this uh, data was from 2006 to 2007, and we already know that the livestock associated MRSA was well distributed in Europe across those countries, uh, and they looked at uh, almost 3,000 isolates, MSA and MRSA, from invasive infections, uh, and they found the ST398 only 12 of those uh, uh, cases. Very, very small number. None of them were, had the MECA gene, meaning they were MSSA, uh, and the other thing is that there were no cases of ST398 MRSA disease. I just point out here, you'll notice I've got that little number T571 spa type in red. Uh, remember that because we'll come back to it. Um, what do we know about North America? Not much, uh, but what we do know uh, is that there was one retrospective study done in Canada. They went back and looked at their isolates and they found five ST398 out of three and a half thousand isolates. Uh, four of those were skin and soft tissue infections, the other wasn't specified. So a very, very small burden of disease, and we know that these organisms are, are um, in the Canadian industry as well. CDC had examined, uh, as of June 2011, uh, Liz and I were both there and heard them say it, 12,000 isolates. They hadn't found any that were not typable. The Minnesota Department of Health, I spoke with Kirk Smith last year, they'd looked at 7,000, had not found any. Uh, similarly, I, I spoke to a, a, a staph aureus specialist in North Carolina. He's never seen a case. So uh, if they're out there in the industry, which they are, they seem to be escaping our health care surveillance uh, if they're happy means they're probably happening at low incidence and low severity. Okay, the other thing that people have looked at in the genomic era is let's look at uh, the genome of the SST398. There are more than 30 known virulence factors for Staph aureus, and that probably the mix of those probably uh, explains why it's such a variable clinical presentation. Um, the first paper I mentioned did a full genome analysis of, the, uh, of pretty much one of the very early strains in Holland. They only found two out of what is about 35 virulence factors, uh, and their conclusion was the lack of virulence factors may explain the infrequency of serious clinical infections. Uh, Another study looked much broader, 100 non-human uh, ST398, so largely from pigs and cattle, uh, lots of antimicrobial resistance determinants, very few virulence determinants. Um, on the fatality side, there are actually only five fatal course, uh, cases reported. Four of them, again, MSSA, and notice our friend type 571, uh, which is not common in pigs. It does happen, but it's not common relative to others. Uh, and these four fatalities had no livestock contact. So things don't quite add up. The only one case of a fatal case, and to this day the only one I'm aware of, uh, was an 85-year-old gentleman who had lung cancer and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and the, the organism was isolated from his pleural fluid. So did he fry, die from it, or did he die with it? Uh, but thus far, you know, the, we had the only case uh, is in a severely medically compromised person. That should make many of you in the room who are exposed to these organisms fairly comfortable, uh, unless you're getting to that stage, I guess. Um, so the public health risk, uh, we know that the, there's ele elevated exposure risk. The risk of infection is not well documented, uh, though there's some stuff coming up in Denmark I'll come back to. Current evidence indicates low transmissibility. It also indicates low virulence. Um, we've seen there's less invasive disease in Europe, not many uh, serious infections, not many virulence decurments, few fatalities. Uh, the Danish thing I'll mention, and this came out on Thursday, the DANMAP report, uh, and the graph is showing you MRSA prevalence uh, either on farm or at the slaughter in the Danish pig industry. And the, the troubling report is that the slaughter, and, and recognise that will grossly overestimate what's going on the farm or, or probably to, um, uh, may double it, uh, at least due to cross-contamination during the slaughter burn. But you can see that over years they've gone from 11% at slaughter to 77%. 
That uh, obviously is uh, attracting attention. The other thing that you'll notice, and this is a graph of human MRSA infection to Denmark where it's notifiable, they have really good data. Uh, you can see that the community associated cases at the top have gone up, uh, the ST398 cases have gone up, and most of those cases are skin and soft tissue infections in people with occupational exposure to, uh, to animals, and particularly pigs, because that's what they've got a lot of in Germany. So there is some evidence, um, severity wise, uh, they don't appear to be uh, severe. Um, the third thing is ST398 bacteremia cases uh, in uh, uh, Denmark have also gone up. Until this year, or 2012, they were all MSSA, um, we, so they weren't MRSA, uh, but they've had their first two uh, MRSA cases that are in bacteremic cases. It's still less than 1% of the bacteremic cases in Denmark. So it's still a very small part of the pie. But what we see is that the impact is still low, um, but the trend is concerning. Um, in the bacteremia cases, all of them, including the MRSA, there was no uh, animal contact, unlike the skin and soft tissue ones, which did have it. Uh, are they associated and how? OK, the plot thickens. So I've told you that's what I know pretty much about this, but the plot thickens because subsequent work says not all ST398 Staph aureus are livestock associated. Um, a report came out of France, uh, 2010, and it was a, a tragic case of a necrotizing pneumonia in a previously healthy 14-year-old girl who died in a few days. So that is a very sad story in any circumstances. If you look what was isolated, ST398, you should be knowing that number, T571. Uh, it was uh, positive for this PVL toxin, which is uh, common in community acquired um, cases uh, and people consider a virulence marker. Most of the pig isolates, or nearly all of them, are negative for that toxin. It was also tet tetracycline susceptible, whereas the pig isolates had, had been uniformly resistant. Uh, it was methicillin susceptible and not, um, and not MSSA, no livestock contact. Con um, and the inference, so what did the authors say? They say the spread of ST398 is, among livestock is a matter of increasing concern because the strains could acquire this virulence to gene. And, and so that spurred, uh, I think Liz got uh, uh, very familiar with that. Uh, and actually Liz and I and Jeff Bender wrote to the Emerging Infections Disease and said, hang on, wait a minute, you can't really make that, e uh, that inference because of this other information. And the other information at that time was that this T5 uh, 71 variant uh, had been reported in families in New York City in the Dominican Republic with no contact with pigs. Uh, there were reports from Beijing, from the city, uh, saying it was the most common MSSA type at a Beijing hospital. Uh, there was a case report from Colombia, uh, all with no apparent livestock contact. Um, of the data I mentioned before, when we look back at those invasive or bacteremia cases that I reviewed, 30% of those bacteremia cases were MSSA caused by this T571 variant. And so we just pointed out, are you jumping the gun saying just because it's ST398 it came from a livestock area? And could some livestock ST398 variants be independent of livestock? Uh, it was nice to be right for once because, unbeknown to me, they were working on that in uh, New York City. So about a year later, uh, a study came out in New York City where they looked at, at various types of Staph aureus disease in people. They found no ST398 in the, what were termed the outpatient MRSA cases. But guess what they found? Our old friend T571 in 5% of non-invasive MSSA, so skin, soft tissue, and 2.5% of MSSA bacteremias. And I'll read exactly what they quoted. They said that this is a clinically important clone that differs significantly at the genome level from its livestock-associated counterpart. And to this day, the only cases of reported infections in the USA that we, uh, we know of are these T571 MSSA, which appear not to have a livestock associated. In fact, they've done more work on this and they've defined there's distinct genetic pig clade and human clade of this organism. Uh, so we can see the plot has thickened and just joining the dots uh, because it's 398 to the pig industry, which our journalists like to do, uh, is probably not valid. The plot thickens again in, in that uh, not all livestock-associated MRSA are ST398. 
so when we look at uh, the discovery of ST398 early on uh, and the colour coding here, when you see orange, that's ST398, and the TO34, anything that's in bold, you pay attention to. The first several studies in the, have now been in the US and we found something else. We find this ST5 variant uh, quite commonly, almost as commonly as ST398. Uh, studies started, people started looking in Asia and guess what they found? They found livestock, apparently, they, in pigs, they found ST9 variants were predominant and almost nothing else um, in the pig reservoir. And uh, guess what? Then all of a sudden now there's an ST9 reported in the US, there's an ST398 reported in Korea. I'll tell you, come back and see me in five years and I'll have a really colourful map for you because I promise you we're going to find more variation as people start uh, looking. Um, in fact, that's already happening. I've just got a list there of... Um, what are, appear to be livestock associated. I mean, there's Staph aureus variants that have been found in pigs that aren't ST398. Uh, the colour coding I'm using is important, green for ST9, uh, red for ST5, because uh, you'll see where we, what we see when we start actually looking at the US. Um, when I, I'm going to report two studies now, that one's still ongoing, uh, one has just uh, been finished, uh, and what we talked about is we thought there was a problem with MRSA myopia, that all these studies were looking at MRSA, no one was actually looking at the parent organism. So we're saying it's sort of tunnel vision, and a lot of what I call it is gotcha epidemiology and journalism. So we look in pork, we got it, we gotcha. See, it's there, it's causing problems, you guys are doing something wrong. Um, and our hypothesis, our rationale really is we're not going to understand MRSA epidemiology unless we understand Staph aureus epidemiology. Uh, and so that's where we went forward. So first study is a pilot study of the ecology of Staph aureus in pig farms. This is a, a master thesis work of uh, Letitia Linearis, uh, who's the wife of Daniel, who many of you will know. Uh, and the second is a longitudinal study of Staph aureus in uh, 68 uh, ASV members, many of whom are in the crowd, and I'm, uh, I'll thank them now and I'll thank them again later, and that's been funded through the NIOSH, uh, through the uh, Upper Midwest Agriculture Safety and Health, and that's going on. We're getting towards the end, finishing up in, uh, in uh, December. So what we've seen in the pig side, we said, OK, what does a farm look like for Staph aureus? Because guess what? It's a data-free environment pretty well. So we did two, a, lo a, lo a detailed longitudinal study of just two uh, conveniently selected multiple site systems in Minnesota. Uh, we're interested in, well, where is it in the pig? We say it's in the nose because guess what? That's what the human literature says. Is that actually true? Uh, does it change with age and stage of production? Uh, so we're really just, uh, just trying to describe the prevalence, diversity of Staph aureus in pigs, people, the environment, air samples, and we did the, our, our standard typing of SPA typing and MLST. So we just had two farms, two cohorts per farm, we, went, we, we sampled sows, suckling, nursery finishing. Uh, in each cohort, just 12 peaks of each type of animal because our hypothesis was this is, this is normal flora, there should be plenty of it there. We shouldn't have to sample 60 animals to find it. Uh, in each animal, we sampled the nose, the tonsil, the skin in the axilla, faeces, and in the sows, the vagina. Uh, it was prevalent in all those sites, but particularly nose, tonsil, and skin were highest, around 60%. Uh, the other thing that we saw was multiple spa types on all farms and multiple star types within pigs. So we didn't know when we started out, if you, does a farm have one variant or does a farm have 100 variants? And we'll, uh, This is spar types by sample source, and this is just to show you uh, it's technicolour. Each colour here, ignore that the, these to designate specific sequence type, it's just to say uh, in both cohorts on both farms there's a lot of variability, uh, particularly in the pig samples. Uh, if you look along the bottom, uh, we have from left to right, we have air, environment, faeces, uh, human, nose, skin, tonsil, vagina. So towards the right we've got most of the pig samples. It's a technicolour scenario. Okay. Um, it gets really interesting when we said, well, what have we got for spar types? And you'll notice something I hope that uh, struck me immediately. About 95% of our isolates belong to uh, our three uh, sequence types of ST398, which is the Dutch variant, ST9, which is what we saw in Asia, and ST5, which is what we're seeing in uh, North America. But all of these were MSSA. 
There was no MRSA here. These were Staph ORS variants that we assumed to be normal uh, flora in these uh, things. So the, the first take on message was, well, that's amazing. Uh, and also, within a farm, it's complex and dynamic. There were th changes between cohorts, so I haven't got time to get into that now. It's what you would expect uh, of a normal flora with diverse genotype within a population that, that things shift and move. I'll now move on to the, the Staph aureus uh, study in the veterinarians. It's an 18-month study. Uh, we're collecting nasal swabs from 68 veterinarians, and I owe these guys big, always will. We'll never pay it off. Uh, Self-collected samples, they mail them in. Uh, we culture them for Staph aureus and MRSA. Uh, we do our typing things, and we do a survey each month. They say, well, how long since they've been with pigs and, and other things, and have they had any injuries, and if they had any uh, clinical infections. So we're getting the health part as well as the the colonisation part, uh, and they're the best research group ever because we've got more than 95% compliance with our swabs and our surveys over three months, so I'm, I'm going to put them up for a award, I think. Uh, one of the quick things we can look at is time since pig contact, and so this is just observational. They just tell us what it is, and you can see that the prevalence is up around close to 80% in people who have recently been in barns and drops to about 60, and that uh, gels with some of the earlier reports that says a lot of this exposure is probably just short-term contamination and not colonisation. Um, the, the prevalence, and I've only got some of it here because it doesn't really change, month to month our vets are around about the 65% overall and it varies month to month, probably random error as much as anything. And you'll notice that our MRSA is running at about 7 or 8% um, in, uh, in the same uh, group of individuals. Um, just so happens that the Dutch have done a similar study published recently where they had veterinarians that they sampled on five point, uh, time points about quarterly. Uh, their MSSA was very similar to ours, uh, but the MRSA was 44%. And there's accumulating data from different studies. We don't really know what our situation in the US, but all the data point to our prevalence being considerably lower to, than, than most of the European countries, particularly Holland, Spain, uh, Germany. There's a lot of variability between countries in Europe, but we seem to be at the lower end, uh, we're not sure why. This is when my, I sort of, my jaw dropped when I started looking, okay, what are we getting in these veterinarians? And if you remember that pie chart from just those two farms, we have about 65% uh, of our veterinary isolates, and these are, are in 15 states across the country, so they're not all going to the same farm or drinking in the same bar, uh, and you can see that uh, those three spa types I put in bold, the ST398, TO34, TO2, ST5, and ST9337, the European variant of, of, of MRSA, the Asian variant, and what we're finding more in, in North America. Uh, and then the reds and the yellows and the greens correspond to other spa types that are in ST5, uh, ST9, or ST398. And so you can see the vast uh, number of isolates from these veterinarians spread across the country are uh, belonging to those three uh, types. If we get down to a really interesting thing, and, and that, those are in the crowd, if you know your number, you won't have seen this before, uh, you can see this is the first nine months to data, and you, I don't expect you to see it in detail, but I want to point out some things. Uh, if we want to look at number 18 here, uh, I can't even get from here, sorry. We want to look, if you look at the numbers across the top, um, I can't do it here, sorry. I just count across the number 18, and, and he's in the crowd, and he knows, he's, you can just see uh, over the months, ST398, ST5, nothing, uh, ST9, nothing, ST398, nothing, uh, ST9, and then a, a, a MRSA, ST5. A lot of variation. When we look at, uh, uh, so we have most of our veterinarians are positive for stay for us. In fact, there's only one now who hasn't been. Uh, most of our veterinarians have diverse strains over time, uh, and the SPA types respond, uh, correspond very closely to what we've seen in our study of just two pig farms. So, uh, so of veterinarians that are consistently positive with the same SPA type, seven of them are ST398 variants, TO34 or others. Uh, three of them are ST5, uh, two are ST9. So there's actually only two permanently colonised veterinarians uh, that, that aren't in this um, these three SPAR type groups, which again, uh, most of these isolates are MSSA. So what we're seeing here is our pig industry appears to be uh, probably broadly colonised with these C groups of SPAR types, which correspond to what's been seen with MRSA globally. 
So uh, about 20% of veterinarians appear to be truly colonised, so transient contamination is way, way more common. Uh, positivities associated with recent pig contact. So I look at this and I ask the question, well, what is the veterinary nose? Is it a surveillance instrument where we can go sniffing across farms and, and sampling, or is it a selective culture medium? And I think the answer is both. Certain individuals will, uh, are prone to uh, long-term colonisation with selected isolates, uh, and this is what is thought to happen with Staph aureus in the human population, you know, the, the normal who aren't uh, swine veterinarians. Uh, and most of the veterinarians are transiently colonated and they, they are actually a surveillance tool. Um, the most important thing that we've found here is that the MSSA variants of common livestock associated types globally are common in US pigs and swine veterinarians. The, of where these things come from, it's very strong evidence that these things aren't new. They've been there probably for uh, decades to millennia, uh, and the acquisition of, uh, of methicillin resistance it may be a relative recent phenomenon. So I just want to finish up now with how I understand this stuff. And, you know, what, basically when you've got the journalists involved, They'll say, OK, they found this thing in a pig and they found it over here, or a chicken they found it in a people, therefore they gave it to them. Um, when we're looking at bacteria particularly, we, we can look at it and say, well, we could have complete host adaptation where things that are in people, like gonorrhea, for example, meningitis, aren't in animals, and things like uh, in pigs, like H. parasuis, never get into, into people, so there's no interspecies transmission. We can say, well, there could be a different model where there's no host adaptation and this bug doesn't see the difference between a pig and a person. I don't believe I know an example of that yet. So the reality that we're dealing with most of the time is that there's some host adaptation uh, and interspecies transmission might be common or it might be uncommon. So in our models of uh, ST398, the original thing was, well, we got this thing, it's come from the livestock, uh, it's got broad host diversity and so it can get all sorts of species including people and this is a, this is a sort of a, a, a bug to be concerned about. Uh, my model is really this one uh, in that uh, it's clear with the ST398 there are human adapted and animal adapted variants. Uh, my suspicion is an ST5 has been found in cattle and in the pig and in people. In fact it's an important human pathogen is that we're going to see this and that's an area that we want to work on. Now we have these isolates from, uh, from pigs and from people in really trying to understand you know, how different or how similar or dissimilar they are and similarly with ST9. Uh, so I think the model going forward is going to look like this. This is my speculation. Um, uh, but it's certainly strongly where the data are, are, are pointing. Uh, there's similarly recently been a report from Italy saying that they've got ST1 uh, MRSA in pigs and people, and they're different. Uh, and I think that we'll probably find that's the case. We've also found ST1 in, uh, in pigs. We have an ongoing pig study. Now we're trying to say, because all our pig data are on two herds. Uh, in fact, uh, my, my volunteers are uh, sampling a farm each for me, or 36 of them are. So we're at least having a look at the pig industry. What is the what does the S or S profile actually look like? Uh, my hypothesis is it's not going to look very different from what we have, uh, and so far that's holding up. Um, so I think the, what we have, what are livestock associated MRSA? I think uh, there are diverse Staph aureus flora that are adapted to swine. Uh, it's likely similar to other animal, animals. There's likely varied propensity for interspecies transmission and likely varied virulence, and that's some of the things we want to understand.